The Secret of Gorsthorpe Grange by Arthur Conan Doyle I am sure that nature never intended me to be a self-made man. There are times when I can hardly bring myself to realize that twenty years of my life were spent behind the counter of a grocer's shop in the East End of London, and that it was through such an avenue that I reached a wealthy independence and the possession of Gorsthorpe Grange. My habits are conservative, and my tastes refined and aristocratic. I have a soul which spurns the vulgar herd. Our family, the D'Odds, date back to a prehistoric era as is to be inferred from the fact that their advent into British history is not commented on by any trustworthy historian. Some instinct tells me that the blood of a crusader runs in my veins. Even now, after the lapse of so many years, such exclamations as, By your lady, rise naturally to my lips, and I feel that should circumstances require it, I am capable of rising in my stirrups and dealing an infidel a blow, say, with a mace, which would considerably astonish him. Gorsthorpe Grange is a feudal mansion, or so it was termed in the advertisement which originally brought it under my notice. Its right to this adjective had a most remarkable effect upon the price, and the advantages gained may possibly be more sentimental than real. Still, it is soothing to me to know that I have slits in my staircase through which I can discharge arrows, and there is a sense of power in the fact of possessing a complicated apparatus by means of which I am enabled to pour molten lead upon the head of the casual visitor. These things chime in with my peculiar humor, and I do not grudge to pay for them. I am proud of my battlements and of the circular uncovered sewer which girds me round. I am proud of my portcullis, and donjon, and keep. There is but one thing wanting to round off the medievalism of my abode, and to render it symmetrically and completely antique. Gorsthorpe Grange is not provided with a ghost. Any man with old-fashioned tastes and ideas as to how such establishments should be conducted would have been disappointed at the omission. In my case it was particularly unfortunate. From my childhood I had been an earnest student of the supernatural, and a firm believer in it. I have reveled in ghostly literature until there is hardly a tale bearing upon the subject which I have not perused. I learned the German language for the sole purpose of mastering a book upon demonology. When an infant I have secreted myself in dark rooms in the hope of seeing some of those bogies with which my nurse used to threaten me and the same feeling is as strong in me now as then. It was a proud moment when I felt that a ghost was one of the luxuries which my money might command. It is true that there was no mention of an apparition in the advertisement. On reviewing the mildewed walls, however, and the shadowy corridors, I had taken it for granted that there was such a thing on the premises, as the presence of a kennel presupposes that of a dog. So I imagine that it was impossible that such desirable quarters should be untenanted by one or more restless shades. Good heavens! What can the noble family from whom I purchased it have been doing during these hundreds of years? Was there no member of it spirited enough to make away with his sweetheart, or take some other steps calculated to establish a hereditary specter? Even now I can hardly write with patience upon the subject. For a long time I hoped against hope. Never did a rat squeak behind the wainscot, or rain drip upon the attic floor without a wild thrill shooting through me as I thought that at last I had come upon traces of some unquiet soul. I felt no such fear upon these occasions. If it occurred in the night time I would send Mrs. Dodd, who is a strong-minded woman, to investigate the matter while I covered up my head with the bedclothes and indulged in an ecstasy of expectation. Alas, the result was always the same. The suspicious sound would be traced to some cause so absurdly natural and commonplace that the most fervid imagination could not clothe it with any of the glamour of romance. I might have reconciled myself to this state of things had it not been for Jurox of Havistock Farm. Jurox is a coarse, burly, matter-of-fact fellow whom I only happen to know through the accidental circumstance of his fields adjoining my domain. Yet this man, 
though utterly devoid of all appreciation of archaeological unities, is in possession of a well-authenticated and undeniable specter. Its existence only dates back, I believe, to the reign of the second George, when a young lady cut her throat upon hearing of the death of her lover at the Battle of Dettingen. Still, even that gives the house an air of respectability, especially when coupled with bloodstains upon the floor. Jurox is densely unconscious of his good fortune, and his language when he reverts to the apparition is painful to listen to. He little dreams how I covet every one of those moans and nocturnal wails which he describes with unnecessary objurgation. Things are indeed coming to a pretty pass when democratic specters are allowed to desert the landed proprietors and annul every social distinction by taking refuge in the houses of the great unrecognized. I have a large amount of perseverance. Nothing else could have raised me into my rightful sphere, considering the uncongenial atmosphere in which I spent the earlier part of my life. I felt now that a ghost must be secured, but how to set about securing one was more than either Mrs. D'Odd or myself was able to determine. My reading taught me that such phenomena are usually the outcome of crime. What crime was to be done then, and who was to do it? A wild idea entered my mind that Watkins, the house steward, might be prevailed upon, for a consideration, to immolate himself or someone else in the interests of the establishment. I put the matter to him in a half-jesting manner, but it did not seem to strike him in a favorable light. The other servants sympathized with him in his opinion, at least I cannot account in any other way for their having left the house in a body the same afternoon. My dear. Mrs. D'Odd remarked to me one day after dinner as I sat moodily sipping a cup of sack. I love the good old names. My dear, that odious ghost of Jurox has been gibbering again. Let it gibber, I answered recklessly. Mrs. D'Odd struck a few chords on her virginal and looked thoughtfully into the fire. I'll tell you what it is, Argentine, she said at last, using the pet name which we usually substituted for Silas. We must have a ghost sent down from London. How can you be so idiotic, Matilda? I remarked severely. Who could get us such a thing? My cousin, Jack Brockett, could, she answered confidently. Now, this cousin of Matilda's was rather a sore subject between us. He was a rakish, clever young fellow who had tried his hand at many things, but wanted perseverance to succeed at any. He was, at that time, in chambers in London professing to be a general agent, and really living to a great extent upon his wits. Matilda managed so that most of our business should pass through his hands, which certainly saved me a great deal of trouble, but I found that Jack's commission was generally considerably larger than all the other items of the bill put together. It was this fact which made me feel inclined to rebel against any further negotiations with the young gentleman. Oh, yes, he could, insisted Mrs. D., seeing the look of disapprobation upon my face. You remember how well he managed that business about the crest? It was only a resuscitation of the old family coat of arms, my dear, I protested. Matilda smiled in an irritating manner. There was a resuscitation of the family portraits, too, dear, she remarked. You must allow that Jack selected them very judiciously. I thought of the long line of faces which adorned the walls of my banqueting hall, from the burly Norman robber through every gradation of cask, plume, and ruff, to the somber Chesterfieldian individual who appears to have staggered against a pillar in his agony at the return of a maiden M.S., which he grips convulsively in his right hand. I was fain to confess that in that instance he had done his work well and that it was only fair to give him an order, with the usual commission, for a family specter, should such a thing be attainable. It is one of my maxims to act promptly when once my mind is made up. Noon of the next day found me ascending the spiral stone staircase which leads to Mr. Brockett's chambers, and admiring the succession of arrows and fingers upon the whitewashed wall, all indicating the direction of that gentleman's sanctum. As it happened, artificial aids of the sort were entirely unnecessary, as an animated flap-dance overhead could proceed from no other quarter, though it was replaced by a deathly silence as I groped my way up the stair. 
The door was opened by a youth, evidently astounded at the appearance of a client, and I was ushered into the presence of my young friend, who was writing furiously in a large ledger, upside down, as I afterwards discovered. After the first greetings I plunged into business at once. "'Look here, Jack,' I said. "'I want you to get me a spirit if you can.' "'Spirits, you mean?' shouted my wife's cousin, plunging his hand into the waste paper basket and producing a bottle with the celerity of a conjuring trick. Let's have a drink. I held up my hand as a mute appeal against such a proceeding so early in the day, but on lowering it again I found that I had almost involuntarily closed my fingers round the tumbler which my adviser had pressed upon me. I drank the contents hastily off, lest anyone should come in upon us and set me down as a topper. After all, there was something very amusing about the young fellow's eccentricities. Not spirits, I explained smilingly. An apparition, a ghost. If such a thing is to be had, I should be very willing to negotiate. A ghost for Gorsthorpe Grange, inquired Mr. Brockett, with as much coolness as if I had asked for a drawing-room suite. Quite so, I answered. Easiest thing in the world, said my companion, filling up my glass again in spite of my remonstrance. Let us see. Here he took down a large red notebook with all the letters of the alphabet in a fringe down the edge. A ghost, you said, didn't you? That's G. Uh, G. Gems, gimlets, gas pipes, gauntlets, guns, galleys. Ah, here we are. Ghosts. Volume 9, Section 6, page 41. Excuse me and Jack ran up a ladder and began rummaging among a pile of ledgers on a high shelf. I felt half inclined to empty my glass into the spittoon when his back was turned, but on second thoughts I disposed of it in a legitimate way. "'Here it is!' cried my London agent, jumping off the ladder with a crash and depositing an enormous volume of manuscript upon the table. "'I have all these things tabulated so that I may lay my hands upon them in a moment. It's all right. It's quite weak. Here he filled our glasses again. What were we looking up again? Ghosts, I suggested. Of course. Page 41. Here we are. J. H. Fowler and Son, Dunkel Street. Suppliers of mediums to the nobility and gentry. Charms sold. Love filtrates. Mummies. Horoscopes cast. Hmm, nothing in your line there, I suppose. I shook my head despondingly. Frederick Tabb, continued my wife's cousin solo channel of communication between the living and dead, proprietor of the spirits of Byron, Kirk, White, Grimaldi, Tom Cribb, and Inigo Jones. That's about the figure. Nothing romantic enough there, I objected. Good heavens, fancy a ghost with a black eye and a handkerchief tied round its waist, or turning somersaults and saying, how are you tomorrow? The very idea made me so warm that I emptied my glass and filled it again. Here's another said my companion, Christopher McCarthy, bi-weekly seances, attended by all the eminent spirits of ancient and modern times, nativities, charms, abracadabras, messages from the dead. He might be able to help us. However, I shall have a hunt round myself tomorrow and see some of these fellows. I know their haunts, and it's odd if I can't pick up something cheap. So there's an end of business, he concluded, hurling the ledger into the corner. And now, We'll have something to drink. We had several things to drink, so many that my inventive faculties were dulled next morning, and I had some little difficulty in explaining to Mrs. Daad why it was that I hung my boots and spectacles upon a peg along with my other garments before retiring to rest. The new hopes excited by the confident manner in which my agent had undertaken the commission caused me to rise superior to alcoholic reaction and I paced about the rambling corridors and old-fashioned rooms, picturing to myself the appearance of my expected acquisition, and deciding what part of the building would harmonize best with its presence. After much consideration I pitched upon the banqueting hall as being, on the whole, the most suitable for its reception. It was a long, low room, hung round with valuable tapestry and interesting relics of the old family to whom it had belonged. Coats of mail and implements of war glimmered fitfully as the light of the fire played over them, and the wind crept under the door, moving the hangings to and fro with a ghastly rustling. 
At one end there was the raised dais on which in ancient times the host and his guests used to spread their table, while a descent of a couple of steps led to the lower part of the hall where the vassals and retainers held wassail. The floor was uncovered by any sort of carpet, but a layer of rushes had been scattered over it by my direction. In the whole room there was nothing to remind one of the nineteenth century, except, indeed, my own solid silver plate stamped with the resuscitated family arms, which was laid out upon an oak table in the center. This, I determined, should be the haunted room, supposing my wife's cousin to succeed in his negotiation with the spirit mongers. There was nothing for it now but to wait patiently until I heard some news of the result of his inquiries. A letter came in the course of a few days which, if it was short, was at least encouraging. It was scribbled in pencil on the back of a playbill and sealed apparently with a tobacco stopper. Am on the track, it said. Nothing of the sort to be had from any professional spiritualist, but picked up a fellow in a pub yesterday who says he can manage it for you. We'll send him down unless you wire to the contrary. Abrahams is his name, and he has done one or two of these jobs before." The letter wound up with some incoherent allusions to a check, and was signed by my affectionate cousin, John Brockett. I need hardly say that I did not wire, but awaited the arrival of Mr. Abrahams with all impatience. In spite of my belief in the supernatural, I could scarcely credit the fact that any mortal could have such a command over the spirit world as to deal in them and barter them against mere earthly gold. Still, I had Jack's word for it that such a trade existed, and here was a gentleman with a Judaical name ready to demonstrate it by proof positive. How vulgar and commonplace Jorok's eighteenth-century ghost would appear should I succeed in securing a real medieval apparition. I almost thought that one had been sent down in advance, for, as I walked down the moat that night before retiring to rest, I came upon a dark figure engaged in surveying the machinery of my portcullis and drawbridge. His start of surprise, however, and the manner in which he hurried off into the darkness speedily convinced me of his earthly origin, and I put him down as some admirer of one of my female retainers, mourning over the muddy Hellespont which divided him from his love. Whoever he may have been, he disappeared and did not return, though I loitered about for some time in the hope of catching a glimpse of him and exercising my feudal rights upon his person. Jack Brockett was as good as his word. The shades of another evening were beginning to darken round Gorsthorpe Grange when a peal at the outer bell and the sound of a fly pulling up announced the arrival of Mr. Abrahams. I hurried down to meet him, half expecting to see a choice assortment of ghosts crowding in at his rear. Instead, however, of being the sallow-faced, melancholy-eyed man that I had pictured to myself, the ghost-dealer was a sturdy little podgy fellow with a pair of wonderfully keen sparkling eyes, and a mouth which was constantly stretched in a good-humored, if somewhat artificial, grin. His sole stock in trade seemed to consist of a small leather bag, jealously locked and strapped, which emitted a metallic chink upon being placed on the stone flags of the walk. "'And how are you, sir?' he asked, wringing my hand with the utmost effusion. "'And the missus? How is she? And all the others? How's all their health?' I intimated that we were all as well as could reasonably be expected. But Mr. Abrahams happened to catch a glimpse of Mrs. D'Odd in the distance, and at once plunged at her with another string of inquiries as to her health, delivered so volubly and with such an intense earnestness that I half expected to see him terminate his cross-examination by feeling her pulse and demanding a sight of her tongue. All this time his little eyes rolled round and round, shifting perpetually from the floor to the ceiling, and from the ceiling to the walls, taking in apparently every article of furniture in a single comprehensive glance. Having satisfied himself that neither of us was in a pathological condition, Mr. Abraham suffered me to lead him upstairs, where a repast had been laid out for him to which he did ample justice. The mysterious little bag he carried along with him and deposited it under his chair during the meal. It was not until the table had been cleared and we were left together that he broached the matter on which he had come down. "'I understand,' he remarked, puffing at a trichinopoly, "'that you want my help in fitting up this here house with a apparition.' 
I acknowledged the correctness of his surmise, while mentally wondering at those restless eyes of his which still danced about the room as if he were making an inventory of the contents. "'And you won't find a better man for the job, though I says it as shouldn't,' continued my companion. "'What did I say to the young gent what spoke to me in the bar of the lame dog? "'Can you do it?' says he. "'Try me,' says I. "'Me and my bag. Just try me. I couldn't say fairer than that.' My respect for Jack Brockett's business capacities began to go up very considerably. He certainly seemed to have managed the matter wonderfully well. "'You don't mean to say that you carry ghosts about in bags?' I remarked with diffidence. Mr. Abraham smiled a smile of superior knowledge. "'You wait,' he said. "'Give me the right place and the right hour with a little of the essence of eucalyptus.' Here he produced a small bottle from his waistcoat pocket and you won't find no ghost that I ain't up to. You'll see them yourself and pick your own. I can't say fairer than that." As all Mr. Abraham's protestations of fairness were accompanied by a cunning leer and a wink from one or other of his wicked little eyes, the impression of candor was somewhat weakened. "'When are you going to do it?' I asked reverentially. Ten minutes to one in the morning,' said Mr. Abrahams with decision. Some says midnight, but I says ten to one, when there ain't such a crowd and you can pick your own ghost. And now, he continued, rising to his feet, suppose you trot me round the premises and let me see where you wants it, for there's some places as attracts em and some as they won't hear of, not if there was no other place in the world. Mr. Abrahams inspected our corridors and chambers with a most critical and observant eye fingering the old tapestry with the air of a connoisseur, and remarking in an undertone that it would match uncommon nice. It was not until he reached the banqueting hall, however, which I had myself picked out, that his admiration reached the pitch of enthusiasm. "'Here's the place!' he shouted, dancing, bag in hand, round the table on which my plate was lying, and looking not unlike some quaint little goblin himself. "'Here's the place!' We won't get nothing to beat this. A fine room, noble, solid. None of your electroplate trash. That's the way as things ought to be done, sir. Plenty of room for em to glide here. Send up some brandy and the box of weeds. I'll, I'll sit here by the fire and do the preliminaries, which is more trouble than you think, for them ghosts carries on awful at times before they find out who they've got to deal with. If you was in the room, they'd tear you to pieces as like as not. You leave me alone to tackle them, and at half-past twelve come in, and I'll lay they'll all be quiet enough by then." Mr. Abraham's request struck me as a reasonable one, so I left him with his feet upon the mantelpiece and his chair in front of the fire, fortifying himself with stimulants against his refractory visitors. From the room beneath, in which I sat with Mrs. D'Odd, I could hear that after sitting for some time he rose up and paced about the hall with quick, impatient steps. We then heard him try the lock of the door, and afterwards drag some heavy article of furniture in the direction of the window on which, apparently, he mounted, for I heard the creaking of the rusty hinges as the diamond-paned casement folded backwards, and I knew it to be situated several feet above the little man's reach. Mrs. D'Odd says that she could distinguish his voice speaking in low and rapid whispers after this, but that may have been her imagination. I confess that I began to feel more impressed than I had deemed it possible to be. There was something awesome in the thought of the solitary mortal standing by the open window and summoning in from the gloom outside the spirits of the netherworld. It was with a trepidation which I could hardly disguise from Matilda that I observed that the clock was pointing to half-past twelve, and that the time had come for me to share the vigil of my visitor. He was sitting in his old position when I entered and there were no signs of the mysterious movements which I had overheard, though his chubby face was flushed as with recent exertion. "'Are you succeeding all right?' I asked as I came in, putting on as careless an air as possible, but glancing involuntarily round the room to see if we were alone. "'Only your help is needed to complete the matter,' said Mr. Abrahams, in a solemn voice. You shall sit by me and partake of the essence of eucalyptus, which removes the scales from our earthly eyes. Whatever you may chance to see, speak not, and make no movement, lest you break the spell." 
His manner was subdued, and his usual cockney vulgarity had entirely disappeared. I took the chair which he indicated and awaited the result. My companion cleared the rushes from the floor in our neighborhood, and, going down upon his hands and knees, described a half-circle with chalk, which enclosed the fireplace and ourselves. Round the edge of this half-circle he drew several hieroglyphics, not unlike the signs of the zodiac. He then stood up and uttered a long invocation, delivered so rapidly that it sounded like a single gigantic word in some uncouth guttural language. Having finished this prayer, if prayer it was, he pulled out the small bottle which he had produced before and poured a couple of teaspoonfuls of clear transparent fluid into the vial, which he handed to me with an intimation that I should drink it. The liquid had a faintly sweet odor, not unlike the aroma of certain sorts of apples. I hesitated a moment before applying it to my lips, but an impatient gesture from my companion overcame my scruples and I tossed it off. The taste was not unpleasant, and as it gave no rise to immediate effects, I leaned back in my chair and composed myself for what was to come. Mr. Abraham seated himself beside me, and I felt that he was watching my face from time to time while repeating some more of the invocations in which he had indulged before. A sense of delicious warmth and languor began gradually to steal over me partly, perhaps, from the heat of the fire, and partly from some unexplained cause. An uncontrollable impulse to sleep weighed down my eyelids, while at the same time my brain worked actively and a hundred beautiful and pleasing ideas flitted through it. So utterly lethargic did I feel that, though I was aware that my companion put his hand over the region of my heart as if to feel how it were beating, I did not attempt to prevent him, nor did I even ask him for the reason of his action. Everything in the room appeared to be reeling slowly round in a drowsy dance of which I was the center. The great elk's head at the far end wagged solemnly backward and forward while the massive salvers on the tables performed cotillions with the claret cooler and the epern. My head fell upon my breast from sheer heaviness, and I should have become unconscious had I not been recalled to myself by the opening of the door at the other end of the hall. This door led on to the raised dais, which, as I have mentioned, the heads of the house used to reserve for their own use. As it swung slowly back upon its hinges, I sat up in my chair, clutching at the arms and staring with a horrified glare at the dark passage outside. Something was coming down it, something unformed and intangible, but still a something. Dim and shadowy, I saw it flit across the threshold, while a blast of ice-cold air swept down the room, which seemed to blow through me, chilling my very heart. I was aware of the mysterious presence, and then I heard it speak in a voice like the sighing of an east wind among pine trees on the banks of a desolate sea. It said, I am the invisible non-entity. I have affinities and am subtle. I am electric, magnetic, and spiritualistic. I am the great ethereal sigh-heaver. I kill dogs. Mortal, wilt thou choose me? I was about to speak, but the words seemed to be choked in my throat, and before I could get them out the shadow flitted across the hall and vanished in the darkness at the other side, while a long-drawn melancholy sigh quivered through the apartment. I turned my eyes toward the door once more and beheld to my astonishment a very small old woman, who hobbled along the corridor and into the hall. She passed backward and forward several times, and then crouching down at the very edge of the circle upon the floor she disclosed a face the horrible malignity of which shall never be banished from my recollection. Every foul passion appeared to have left its mark upon that hideous countenance. Ha <laughs> ha! she screamed, holding out her wizened hands like the talons of an unclean bird. You see what I am. I am the fiendish old woman. I wear snuff-colored silks. My curse descends on people. Sir Walter was partial to me. Shall I be thine, mortal?" I endeavored to shake my head in horror on which she aimed a blow at me with her crutch, and vanished with an eldritch scream. By this time my eyes turned naturally toward the open door, and I was hardly surprised to see a man walk in of tall and noble stature. 
His face was deadly pale, but was surmounted by a fringe of dark hair which fell in ringlets down his back. A short pointed beard covered his chin. He was dressed in loose-fitting clothes made apparently of yellow satin, and a large white ruff surrounded his neck. He paced across the room with slow and majestic strides. Then turning, he addressed me in a sweet, exquisitely modulated voice. I am the cavalier, he remarked. I pierce and am pierced. Here is my rapier. I clink steel. This is a bloodstain over my heart. I can emit hollow groans. I am patronized by many old conservative families. I am the original manor house apparition. I work alone or in company with shrieking damsels. He bent his head courteously as though awaiting my reply, but the same choking sensation prevented me from speaking, and with a deep bow he disappeared. He had hardly gone before a feeling of intense horror stole over me, and I was aware of the presence of a ghastly creature in the room, of dim outlines and uncertain proportions. One moment it seemed to pervade the entire apartment, while at another it would become invisible, but always leaving behind it a distinct consciousness of its presence. Its voice, when it spoke, was quavering and gusty. It said, I am the lever of footsteps and the spiller of gouts of blood. I tramp upon corridors. Charles Dickens has alluded to me. I make strange and disagreeable noises. I snatch letters and place invisible hands on people's wrists. I am cheerful. I burst into peals of hideous laughter. Shall I do one now? I raised my hand in a deprecating way, but too late to prevent one discordant outbreak which echoed through the room. Before I could lower it, the apparition was gone. I turned my head toward the door in time to see a man come hastily and stealthily into the chamber. He was a sunburned, powerfully built fellow, with earrings in his ears and a Barcelona handkerchief tied loosely round his neck. His head was bent upon his chest, and his whole aspect was that of one afflicted by intolerable remorse. He paced rapidly backward and forward, like a caged tiger, and I observed that a drawn knife glittered in one of his hands, while he grasped what appeared to be a piece of parchment in the other. His voice when he spoke was deep and sonorous. He said, I am a murderer. I am a ruffian. I crouch when I walk. I step noiselessly. I know something of the Spanish main. I can do the lost treasure business. I have charts, am able-bodied, and a good walker, capable of haunting a large park. He looked toward me beseechingly, but before I could make a sign I was paralyzed by the horrible sight which appeared at the door. It was a very tall man, if indeed it might be called a man, for the gaunt bones were protruding through the corroding flesh, and the features of a leaden hue. A winding sheet was wrapped round the figure and formed a hood over the head from under the shadow of which two fiendish eyes, deep set in their grisly sockets, blazed and sparkled like red-hot coals. The lower jaw had fallen upon the breast, disclosing a withered, shriveled tongue and two lines of black and jagged fangs. I shuddered and drew back as this fearful apparition advanced to the edge of the circle. I am the American blood curdler it said in a voice which seemed to come in a hollow murmur from the earth beneath it. None other is genuine. I am the embodiment of Edgar Allan Poe. I am circumstantial and horrible. I am a low-caste, spirit-subduing specter. Observe my blood and my bones. I am grisly and nauseous. No depending on artificial aid. Work with grave clothes, a coffin lid, and a galvanic battery turn hair white in a night. The creature stretched out its fleshless arms to me as if in entreaty, but I shook my head and it vanished, leaving a low, sickening, repulsive odor behind it. I sank back in my chair, so overcome by terror and disgust that I would have very willingly resigned myself to dispensing with a ghost altogether, could I have been sure that this was the last of the hideous procession. A faint sound of trailing garments warned me that it was not so. I looked up and beheld a white figure emerging from the corridor into the right. As it stepped across the threshold I saw that it was that of a young and beautiful woman dressed in the fashion of a bygone day. Her hands were clasped in front of her, and her pale, proud face bore traces of passion and of suffering. 
She crossed the hall with a gentle sound, like the rustling of autumn leaves, and then turning her lovely and unutterably sad eyes upon me, she said, I am the plaintiff and sentimental, the beautiful and ill-used. I have been forsaken and betrayed. I shriek in the night-time and glide down passages. My antecedents are highly respectable and generally aristocratic. My tastes are aesthetic. Old oak furniture like this would do, with a few more coats of mail and plenty of tapestry. Will you not take me?" Her voice died away in a beautiful cadence as she concluded, and she held out her hands as in supplication. I am always sensitive to female influences. Besides, what would Jorok's ghost be to this? Could anything be in better taste? Would I not be exposing myself to the chance of injuring my nervous system by interviewing with such creatures as my last visitor unless I decided at once?" She gave me a seraphic smile, as if she knew what was passing in my mind. That smile settled the matter. "'She will do,' I cried. "'I choose this one.' And as in my enthusiasm I took a step toward her, I passed over the magic circle which had girdled me round. Argentine! We have been robbed!" I had an indistinct consciousness of these words being spoken, or rather screamed in my ear a great number of times without my being able to grasp their meaning. A violent throbbing in my head seemed to adapt itself to their rhythm, and I closed my eyes to the lullaby of robbed, robbed, robbed. A vigorous shake caused me to open them again, however, and the sight of Mrs. D'Odd in the scantiest of costumes and most furious of tempers was sufficiently impressive to recall all my scattered thoughts, and make me realize that I was lying on my back on the floor, with my head among the ashes which had fallen from last night's fire, and a small glass vial in my hand. I staggered to my feet, but felt so weak and giddy that I was compelled to fall back into a chair. As my brain became clearer, stimulated by the exclamations of Matilda, I began gradually to recollect the events of the night. There was the door through which my supernatural visitors had filed. There was the circle of chalk with the hieroglyphics round the edge. There was the cigar box and brandy bottle which had been honored by the attentions of Mr. Abrahams. But the seer himself? Where was he? And what was this open window with a rope running out of it? And where, oh, where was the pride of Gorsthorpe Grange, the glorious plate which was to have been the delectation of generations of D'Odds? And why was Mrs. D. standing in the gray light of dawn, wringing her hands and repeating her monotonous refrain? It was only very gradually that my misty brain took these things in and grasped the connection between them. Reader. I have never seen Mr. Abraham since. I have never seen the plate stamped with the resuscitated family crest. Hardest of all, I have never caught a glimpse of the melancholy specter with the trailing garments, nor do I expect that I ever shall. In fact, my night's experiences have cured me of my mania for the supernatural, and quite reconciled me to inhabiting the humdrum nineteenth-century edifice on the outskirts of London which Mrs. D. has long had in her mind's eye. As to the explanation of all that occurred, that is a matter which is open to several surmises. That Mr. Abrahams, the ghost hunter, was identical with Jemmy Wilson, alias the Nottingham Crackster, is considered more than probable at Scotland Yard, and certainly the description of that remarkable burglar tallied very well with the appearance of my visitor. The small bag which I have described was picked up in a neighboring field next day, and found to contain a choice assortment of jimmies and center bits. Footmarks deeply imprinted in the mud on either side of the moat showed that an accomplice from below had received the sack of precious metals which had been let down through the open window. No doubt the pair of scoundrels, while looking round for a job, had overheard Jack Brockett's indiscreet inquiries, and had promptly availed themselves of the tempting opening. And now, as to my less substantial visitors, and the curious grotesque vision which I enjoyed, am I to lay it down to any real power over occult matters possessed by my Nottingham friend? For a long time I was doubtful upon the point, and eventually endeavored to solve it by consulting a well-known analyst and medical man, sending him the few drops of the so-called essence of eucalyptus which remained in my vial. 
I append the letter which I received from him, only too happy to have the opportunity of winding up my little narrative by the weighty words of a man of learning. Arundel Street. Dear Sir, your very singular case has interested me extremely. The bottle which you sent contained a strong solution of chloral, and the quantity which you describe yourself as having swallowed must have amounted to at least eighty grains of the pure hydrate. This would, of course, have reduced you to a partial state of insensibility, gradually going on to complete coma. In this semi-unconscious state of chloralism it is not unusual for circumstantial and bizarre visions to present themselves, more especially to individuals unaccustomed to the use of the drug. You tell me in your note that your mind was saturated with ghostly literature, and that you had long taken a morbid interest in classifying and recalling the various forms in which apparitions have been said to appear. You must also remember that you were expecting to see something of that very nature, and that your nervous system was worked up to an unnatural state of tension. Under the circumstances, I think that, far from the sequel being an astonishing one, it would have been very surprising indeed to anyone versed in narcotics had you not experienced some such effects. I remain, dear sir, sincerely yours. T. E. Stoob, M. D. Argentine de Odd, Esquire, The Elms, Brixton. End of The Secret of Gorsthorpe Grange by Arthur Conan Doyle Thank you.